So welcome back to episode 13 or series three, episode three, I think if I'm counting right this time, I got it wrong last time, so I apologize for that, um, of the Deep Analysis podcast, the We Love Ugly Data uh, podcast. Um, with me this time is Dan, so uh, welcome, Dan. Hey, everybody. Lovely, excellent. Um, so for those of you who are, who are maybe new to the podcast, maybe Dan has brought in his usual extra additional audience for, uh, for his episodes. Let's just run through the format of the podcast. People who've been here before know part of the format of the podcast is telling you the format of the podcast. So here's the format of the podcast. It is three topics. It is 30 minutes. It is roughly about 10 minutes a topic. I try my best to keep to that. But, like you know, I don't want to be a super enforcer if we're having an interesting conversation. Um, but the idea is to keep this relatively compact into our into our three topics as Dan's on. It's going to be quite IDP focused, but not entirely IDP focused. Um, we will still be legally compliant and we will be talking about Gen AI and therefore the police will not have to be called and we won't have to be dragged away to the cells to explain why we weren't talking about the topic du jour of last year and again this year. So we'll get on to that. So let's get on to the, 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 the first topic and there'll be just a little bit of a kind of recap at the beginning of that. So our first topic, Dan, a rational exuberance. Now, this relates to... Um, your big piece of research, your um, your your epic of the, of the year, um, which is the uh, um, IDP market analysis uh, twenty four through twenty seven. So before maybe we get on to the the exuberance, maybe we need to set the scene a little bit. Maybe you could give a, just a little bit of an introduction for maybe for people who haven't um, read the previous versions or haven't yet um shaken down the piggy bank to buy this copy which of course they should the moment they've finished listening to this podcast go and buy a copy just give us a little introduction <laughs> to what's in there why sh why people should read it um why people should buy it and why they should buy multiple copies for friends and family maybe yeah hey thanks for that uh, plug i appreciate that uh so right uh uh we just uh, uh finished up uh the end of January, uh, several months of research uh, uh, into the intelligent document processing market. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, Matt, uh, I'm reminded, uh, uh, I'm sort of uh, having a, a mental block because I spend so much time on this report and there's so much in it that yeah. I can't, I can't talk about it. Oh, thank you. The table of contents. <laughs> so I, for, for those of you who are listening rather than watching, I've just brought up the table of contents of the report onto the screen, yeah. um, which has yeah. sparked Dan's brain back into life. Yeah, thank you. You yeah, spent so, so much time close to, and Matt uh, uh, writes the reports too, uh, and we spent so much time doing this research, mm -hmm. and sometimes somebody else has to step away from it and look at it and say, Oh, you know what? That looks really interesting, but I'll do my best here. Um, so this is an encyclopedic uh, look at the marketplace. Um, we have compiled a database of some 350 vendors who make IDP products of some sort. Mm -hmm. uh, they claim to, and we have actually looked at all these companies and verified uh, a check mark. Yes, that is IDP. Um, mm -hmm. And our IDP definition, by the way, is slightly different uh, than uh, some of the other analysts who have jumped on the IDP bandwagon in the past year. Um, anything that, any software that reads a document and extracts information from it mm -hmm. is intelligent document processing. Uh, and so we broaden the market from the usual suspects, the Cofaxes of the world, uh, and Abbey and Hyperscience and Instabase, uh, mm -hmm. uh, awesome companies that are becoming very familiar now uh, with their marketing. Um, we've gone way deeper than that and looked into niches such as invoice processing, where there are 70 software companies wow. that use IDP technologies to read and process invoices. Mm -hmm. uh, and you would never hear of them if all you look for and search for on Google is IDP. But right. in its own right, that's an IDP product. We also are the first analyst firm to look at the impact of IDP in data analytics, uh, which has really come to light now with LLMs being uh, built by companies, specialized LLMs, and they've got all this unstructured data. Mm -hmm. We love data, right? Ugly Absolutely. data. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. 
And how do you get that data purified and ready to go into your LLM? Well, you need tools that are very, very similar to intelligent document processing. So, so we're let's covering come back that. Onto, let's come back onto LLMs in, in, in a little bit. Let's, for the first time, let's just return back. It was a really good introduction. Thank you, Dan, for that. Let's get a little Thanks. bit onto our, onto our exuberance. So the example, yeah, thank you. Because, uh, the exuberance uh, uh, theme here is that um, yeah. from the discussions you've had, a lot of these 350 companies seem to be very optimistic about how their revenue is going to grow the next period. Maybe as you conducted the research, yeah. you can tell us a little bit more. Yeah, so we sent out a survey uh, and we heard back from 54 vendors, which is a, a very oh. large sample in this market. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. And one of the questions we asked them was, uh, how do you expect your revenue to grow in 2024 compared to last year? An astounding 40% responded 100% growth, double their business in 2024. Um, and then another 21%, as you can see, if you're looking at the chart, uh, yep. another 21% expect 50% growth. So 61% of the respondents, I yes. think they're going to grow their business by 50% or more in 2024. That's maybe a rational exuberance. The reason why is because if you click again uh, and bring up, uh, we're forecasting much less exuberant growth yes. for the IDP market in 2024. We think it's going to grow at 20%, which is still a, a fast growth for a market that's already sitting at about $3 billion. Yes. Uh, so what's the difference? And uh, what I wrote in the report was uh, one has to take the vendor input with a grain of salt. Of course. Yes. Particularly around vendors, which vendors yeah. of which size, of what phase of life are recording. Right. Exactly. Many of the vendors who are in the 100 um, percent or more, as I looked at the sample, are funded by venture capital and they have yeah. taken large amounts of investment. And so I think there's a sense almost of urgency among those vendors, in some cases, maybe even desperation, that they really got to step on the pedal this year, uh, especially with all the hype around Gen AI and how it's going to yeah. transform use cases uh, uh, with end users. So we think it's going to grow slower than that overall. There's also a case of there are some large vendors who've been around for a while, who are, by revenue, are the largest vendors in the marketplace, yep. they think they're going to grow 10%, maybe 20%, uh, and that drags down the overall sample. Then there's a few vendors who actually were honest, and their sales declined. Um, we don't name vendors, of course, in our study. Mm -hmm. We don't, we don't uh, uh, reveal individual vendor revenue numbers because they entrust us with that information, Matt. So, yep. you know, it's some vendors may get lucky and grow 100%. Um, yep. And yep. it's also, if you grow from 1 million to 2 million when you're a startup, that's 100%. But it's yep. a lot harder to go from 10 million to 20 million. Trust oh, me, absolutely. Yes, yes. And I think it's, yeah. you know, uh, you know like, like you, I've, I've you know, spent a lot of time over the last sort of 10, 15 years talking to, to startup companies. And Often a part of their early pitch will be, we're doing great, we're growing 100% a year. And to which my response would be, not normally to them, but in writing would be, that's good, because if you're not, you're going to die. And it's the same way as when you look at, we're into almost into the uh, the baby bird time of the year. And if you look at the life lifespan of a baby bird, they grow a lot of weight really quickly because they have to or they won't make it out of the nest. And then they get to another point of being a kind of an adult and that growth becomes a lot more stable. Companies are a lot like baby birds in that respect. That we, we really do uh, need to great, see that. That's a great, great metaphor. Yeah, I like that metaphor a lot. Uh, so I, I think, in sort of in summary, uh, the way I see it is trust deep analysis. We're the adults in the room here. Okay. <laughs> um, individual vendors are uh, in this marketplace. Everybody's so excited. I, I talked to one yesterday that's on that 100 percent thing. Uh -huh. Yeah. And I can't give any names away, but the CEO told me that um, there's just a level of excitement that they've seen in the market that they, they, they've never seen in their five years since they started. Uh, and the way he pictured it was this. Um, uh, their salespeople used to, when they're talking to leads, um, they had to 
spend like the entire phone call on the first phone call talking to a prospect, why would AI help your business? So uh-huh. they had to educate them. Yeah. Now, now it's totally different. The prospects are saying, we need AI. Tell us how you can give it to us. <laughs> and that's yeah. all come because of all the hype and the news and education that's been brought to us by, thanks to Microsoft uh, and OpenAI yeah. and others in this uh, past 12 months, man. Yeah, and I think that's really interesting. You made a couple of good points, one or two of which I think I'm going to come back to in the third topic, because we're going to talk a little bit more broadly about research data in the third topic. And I know that, you know, I spend a lot of my time gathering it. You spend a lot of time in your time gathering. So it's so interesting stuff that we can come to for that. But I think we, yeah. if we look at, I mean, obviously, for people who are listening to this, um, the second figure that's up on screen for, for, for those on, on video can see actually that we're looking at, um, you know, projected growth for the IDP market of, you know, from from twenty percent in in twenty twenty four to sixteen percent in twenty twenty seven, which is a, which is a relatively good stable uh, set of set of growth, and showing really an increasingly maturing market, which differs really if we look at the the, the auto responses, which is you know as da, as Dan said, like sixty over sixty percent said, look, we're going to be uh, you know increasing revenue between fifty and one hundred percent. These are different pieces of data. You can't extrapolate these two things by adding them together. They are they are just dis- different and discreet and need to be treated differently and, and, and discreetly um, when you're when you're yeah. writing your headlines. <laughs> yeah, they, they are. Um, and uh, the other thing that's going to happen is that's a uh, Matt and I are looking at a five year projection uh, mm-hmm. based on starting on 2023 last year. Uh, so the headline is the IDP market should double in size in uh, over the next four years, and that's. That's pretty good, mm-hmm. uh, considering that this was a marketplace that limped along for decades. Yeah, at five yeah. to ten percent growth. So happy days. And as we talked about last time, I mean, we've this is I think the third or fourth time that the, we that you've been on Dan as a as a single guest, excluding our Christmas prediction extravaganza, which I, I enjoyed, and I hopefully we'll do that again this year. Um, and we've talked about in the past about you know the. The, the, the many stages of the um, IDP market. I will put in the show notes um, links back to those previous episodes. So if you want to go, think to yourself, wow, this is the first time I've heard Dan talking about this market. Um, you know, I, uh, I really want to hear more of this. Well, may, maybe you should get out a bit more. But it, it, even so, I'll put links to those so you can go back and listen to the previous ones where we talk about the, how this market generated. And of course, one of those things that we talked about last time when we talked about, you know, how do we get here with IDP? Was um, you know the 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 transformation of the market that happened with the introduction of transformers, um, uh, you know, mm. the, the, as a result of the Google Translate project, which kind of moved it forward, and the long term output of that was the explosion in sort of twenty late twenty two and and throughout twenty three and continuing to twenty four with the impact of Gen AI across the software market um, in how people are positioning. Uh, um, um, uh, they're, 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 you know, their ongoing uh, changes to, to products and platforms. Um, and you've pointed that um, IDP is no is no different. In fact, it's probably, as we said last time, perhaps the market where Gen AI will be able to pay for itself in terms of um, yeah. investment faster than any other because it fits very e- neatly into the existing. It basically makes the existing use cases better and quicker. Yes. So yes. let's just get a little bit into that in a second. For, um, on the screen, we've got, again, um, a stat from the report, which is about the adaptation of, of, of Gen AI. Do you want to just want to talk a little bit about um, about what's behind this stat? Um, and obviously, quote the stat for people who are, uh, who are listening rather than watching. Right. So another question we asked in our survey was uh, to the vendors, um, are you using generative AI in your platform? Uh huh. 75% of the respondents said yes. Uh, in digging deeper, uh, very few of them actually had a product in market. Yeah. But they had something in beta or something tested. A few of them have actually, uh, uh, since we did the survey, have actually launched. Uh, generative AI features within their products. Uh, of course, um, uh, we covered UiPath and their fabulous clipboard AI thing that made Time yep. Magazine, you know, and, and yep, Instabase yep. and AI Hub. Uh, those things are real. They're out there. You can mm-hmm. use those today. Um, but some of the other vendors that are doing intelligent document processing at scale, right, they're doing volumes, not one at a time. 
yeah. They have had to take a more cautious approach to that because of cost and volume uh, pressures. Um, but still, 75% is an astounding mm-hmm. uh, adoption within only 12 months, really, of, yeah. of most companies wigging on to this, Matt. Uh, so digging deeper, I talked to last year over 50 IDP vendors. Uh-huh. Um, and <laughs> 49 of the 50 told me that, yes, we're, we think that generative AI is transformative, and here's the reason why. So to backtrack again a little bit, um, what happened? Well, a side effect of Gen AI, it wasn't what OpenAI set out to do, by the way. They didn't mm-hmm. set out to read documents. No, they set out to generate content. That's what generative AI is. But a side effect of that is you could feed uh, chat GPT or any of the the uh, LLMs, you could feed it text and ask it questions about the task, and then it would do its thing. It would generate a response based on the text you gave it. Um, And that was like, that's like a superpower for IDP. Sure. Uh, Let's let's get get into those use cases for IDP a little bit more, because I'm bringing up on screen a graphic that you've borrowed or stolen from the artist formerly known as Kofax and is now known (laughs) as Tungsten Automation. We've all yeah. got to get used to saying that. It's, it doesn't chip off the tongue just yet, particularly for people who've been around the industry a long time. It will probably always be Kofax in the same way that Snickers will always yeah. be Marathon in the UK. <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, disclaimer here, I worked for Kofax in the past. Um, and so I know a little bit more about uh, than the average person. Uh, the folks at uh, Tungsten Automation, formerly known as Kofax, um, were brave enough when they talked about generative AI and its impact on IDP, were brave enough to compare it to their own current state of their own products, mm-hmm. which I thought was, was astounding because what they were basically saying is the stuff we do today for data extraction and summarization and intent analysis, sentiment analysis, um, you know, we've been doing it the hard way. Yeah. Using LLMs, it completely changes the way we do it by making it faster, easier, less people, less training. Um, and they did that six months before they actually are going to have a product available. Right. Uh, I can say this today because uh, I was under embargo with uh, Tungsten not to say anything about it. But today they're launching uh, Total Agility uh, with Generative Insights. Uh, and they briefed me on it a couple of weeks ago, showed me the stuff, and it looks pretty darn good. Uh, it doesn't change their product platform completely. It just makes it so much easier to do some of the core functionalities of IDP that we've all struggled with for years, and those are how do you figure out which fields to extract from a document without mm-hmm. spending 100 samples trying to annotate the document? Yeah. Bingo. Sol- solved. Um, number two. How do you um, summarize content uh, from a document that you've just extracted data from? Mm-hmm. Everybody's been working on L- NLP solutions. You were working on that stuff years ago, right? Absolutely, yes. Yeah, yeah. and you you must know that generative AI does bring a new uh, uh, way to help with that. Uh, that used to take us months and months and millions of dollars, lots of developers, to come mm-hmm. up with a solution. Uh, now, out of the box, it still hallucinates, and that's the problem. But people like Tungsten and um, Rawson, who I just uh, posted about, uh, that's why I was late for the uh, <laughs> podcast recording today. Uh, Rawson's just introduced their own LLM that's fine tuned right. for transactional documents like invoices. That's going to eliminate the hallucination problems. Uh, Tungsten. Well, is, that's quite a that's quite um, a bold claim, and, I, and what I will do in the. Um, in the show notes, again, we're recording this on the 27th of February, which is the best way of, of getting uh, diaries corroborated. But you're probably going to be watching this sometime in March. So by the time, <laughs> but so by the I will make sure we've got the um, the show notes, the links to the Tugson automation and to the Rosen uh, announcement as well that, that Dan's talking about. So don't pause and run off and go and look at them. They'll probably yeah. be below while you're reading this right now. So bottom line, uh, uh, oh, oh, here's the other thing. So. Um, so generative AI in and of itself isn't good enough to, to meet the SLAs of the average IDP application uh-huh. of an end user Yeah, because hallucination, ain't, it just ain't any good. Uh, one of the best examples was the IRS uh, has created its own LLM uh, 
um, so that it could read all of the IRS manuals. That, the IRS, right. for those right. of you in the UK or Germany, the IRS is the Internal Revenue Service in the United States. It's the tax man. Mm -hmm. um, and so they created their own LLM trained only on IRS PDFs, mm -hmm. which are like voluminous. Like we're talking yes. tens yes. of millions of pages, right? Yes. So that it could provide advice reliably to a person trying to fill out their tax forms. And uh, they haven't released it yet. The work is still underway on that. But at some point, um, that's going to be an example of a fine-tuned LLM that doesn't hallucinate, well, mm -hmm. at least as much. Because we can all agree that hallucination from the tax man's chatbot might be a bad thing, right? Yeah, um, so two things there. One, on record, I don't like the term hallucination and I don't use it, but I realize that I'm fighting a losing battle on that. And two, there's definitely a joke about an IRS LMM that asks, if you ask you a question, it will reply within 28 days in writing. <laughs> um, yes, but it, <laughs> but it will calculate your tax bill immediately and send you a bill. Oh, of course. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. And, I, and obviously, um, for those who are interested, billing, funnily enough, is actually one of the um, upcoming exciting topics that those people who are, are making heavy use of LLM will be facing up to. We talked about it um, last year. I wrote about it last year. Um, yeah, yeah. So, you know, for those are people who got very excited a few years ago about the difficulties, not difficulties, but challenges with doing, with predicting um, cloud compute billing, um, you're about to have exactly the same problem again with LMM billing. So if that's an opportunity for you, it was great. If you hated doing that, you're going to hate doing this too. So um, that yeah, means it's so on a little never, bit well. never, never before has uh, this phrase been more important. Caveat emptor. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I will also put a reference to that in the show notes, if I remember. <laughs> this is why I do the show notes very shortly after recording these, because otherwise I, I forget the individual little bits. The last one, I had to put loads of notes in about situationalism and free jazz. So you never know what you're going to get on this podcast. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, it was great. Uh, I, I really dug that, man. Yeah, yeah. cool. Absolutely. You're, 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 you're hip to that. That's good. Um, so the last topic for, for today um, to wrap up, and I think, obviously, we're, we're, you know, we've been focusing a little bit on IDP today for, for, for Dan's one. The next um, uh, podcast that Alan and I will do, um, for release in April will probably be around the time when my um, uh, work intelligence market forecast comes out. So we've both been doing a little bit of, of, of uh, a lot, an awful lot of research recently. I published a blog um, earlier this month, being February, so beginning of February, for those people who are listening to this in, in March or, or onwards, about some of the lessons that I got from actually introducing new data points into the research. And I thought it was good to give a little bit of it a little bit of insight into how I go about building these data sets and how I go about um, making sure that what we release is, is um, has the right kind of efficacy, if you like, in, in um, uh, out there. And also a little bit of insight into how I and other analysts go about building um, market forecasts, because they, they, they're not magic. What they are is hard data and an awful lot of spreadsheets and an awful lot of research to, to dig them up. But they're based on things that are relatively easy to understand. For the um, uh, work intelligence, I added um, some new stuff this, this, uh, for this release based on, on location of vendors and scale of vendors. And I thought that was um, you know, kind of useful to get into those because they, they kind of revealed a little bit. So the blog tells you in more detail. Let's just pick up one of those. Um, because it's, it's actually kind of relates to a core topic that you and I had a conversation in the past on this pod, Dan, about um, where vendors come from. And we talked a little bit about the difference between Europe and, and, and the US. So one of the, um, the data points I've added into work intelligence is just adding a piece of geodata for continent and country of origin for every vendor. I've not got 350 in mine. Mine's more like 200, so it's not quite as long. So the idea is that, of course, well, you give can- Give it time, man. Give it well, time. Give it, give it time, right? They're adding ones more all the time. So it meant that someone could say, hey, of all these vendors, you know, what percentage are in North America? What percentage are in Europe? What percentage are in South Asia, South America, um, Asia Pac, for argument's sake? Which in itself seems a fairly innocent piece of data. However, what that fails to give you often and we, we talked a little bit earlier on about baby birds, which was not in my show notes, but, you know, about how companies as they go through life change. Now, the ge geographic location of companies through their life also changes. Um, 
companies move as, as you know as, as they get older, particularly when they start to approach public markets. So the example I gave in, in the in the blog post was was it was UiPath, a company that Dan covers and I covers. If you ask them where are they based, their HQ is in New York. They are very much a Romanian company by birth. So during their life, as they've got older, they have migrated. This is another, right. another bird related term. They have migrated from one place to another as their business has changed and as their company has changed. So if you looked at it purely on a piece of pie chart data, you go, hey, well, UiPath, they're, they're one of the cohort in the US. Therefore, you know, that adds to the weight of the US being the powerhouse here. But we, of course, we know actually that hides within it um, uh, you know, there's a, a story of it. So even with something that's fairly innocent, like geographic data, the way in which you use that geographic data to make a claim, and that claim could be, hey, this market is heavily based here, or companies here are the most successful, or this revenue can all be associated with companies started here in this location, it can be a bit misleading. And I think what are your feelings down now you do a lot of these kind of, uh, of, of um, adding additional data uh, from year to year what are your experiences oh very similar uh the, the the first thing is that uh nobody is actually going to see the data that i crunch except uh for mm -hmm. alan and and maybe you in a peer review right yeah yeah uh and so you know we have to be careful not to become captives of our own uh numbers right um because it's it's a view of the world that we've created for example when it, when i sent my research uh questions out uh the survey was created by me mm -hmm. um, and so there's no way to keep my view of what i'm, I'm looking for from affecting the questions that were asked in the first place yeah um, we did give some uh uh, opportunities for the vendors to have free text answers mm -hmm. uh, but as you know it, you know when you get uh, into dozens and hundreds of responses it's very difficult to quantify the free text answers um, yeah. and so you kind of go back to the multiple choice of the checkbox to do your data analysis of, of that research yeah so that's the first thought is that this is private it's the stuff that that we don't publish the details of our research. Yeah. So what happens in our reports is we're presenting you with an analysis of the data that we've researched uh, mm -hmm. and trying to explain how it's relevant. I did a location-based uh, uh, a study too of IDP vendors where they're located at, uh, similar. And the takeaway for me was that uh, IDP is very local because it's all about solving somebody's document problem. Uh -huh. And so when, when the Ukrainian IDP company startup called me and said, hey, you know, we're here. And I said, well, why did you guys start up? Because they used to be a UiPath um, reseller. Uh -huh. And they said, well, because these guys doing invoice processing don't know how to do a Ukrainian invoice yeah. as good sure. as we can. Yeah. So that's part of the story of why, you know, these companies start in in locations now when they try to go out of ukraine and they try to go to germany well guess what i mean they're not going to be as good with a ukrainian invoice engine when they get there so they have to hire people who understand the local market and yeah. that's what's underlying this sort of any company can become global today yeah it's not that easy and that's the other part of the research i think that we have to surface yeah and i think that's, that's a perfect example of one the narrative that's often underneath the data and you can really only get into that with really inquiry time it's actually sitting and saying hey talk talk yeah. me through the data why is that because there's a certain amount of analysis we put in the reports but we like to keep them down to just the bare ten thousand words so we can't have can't be too exhaustive um now of course that's part of it to encourage people to talk to us we're not just locked in our rooms like prisoners uh, turning out data we actually do like to have the old conversation with people so to, to use that use inquiry time and, and come and talk to us to, to, to explain it um, within the within the blog post um, there's a whole other thing about how I've been really careful with using sizing data because it's very easy to double count employees when you're when you're starting to yep. break out because breaking out which employees work on what products in what geography is impossible um, yep. so whereas we do revenue splits 
trying to do employee splits is really, really hard. So once you get into yeah, more granular yeah. data, you can double count employees and it gets a bit dangerous. So again, I think it's going to be really, really open about that. But the kind of the, the, the too long didn't read kind of conclusion that I, I put in the blog post here is, look, we collect a lot more data than we publish, right? Mm -hmm. um, we, as Dan said, we only publish the analysis of the data, but even we, pub we collect a lot more data and analyze data than we actually write about because we're balancing collecting data with the efficacy and accuracy of that data. And that's something often we can only really get to when we start to actually get into the spreadsheet and go, now that looks good, that looks bad, that looks weird. We can get into that a little bit more. So, you know, yeah. also we the other thing is we're also adding this over time and often it's not the first time we collect the data is when we publish it. We like it to mature. Um, uh, over a period of a period of time, because you know, a year one piece of data is very spiky in how it appears. Year two and year three might be quite spiky. Over five years, then you start to see some kind of semblance of patination within it, which becomes yeah. useful for analysis. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, Matt, we're both in the sort of uh, similar situation. Uh, this was this was my second IDP market report, so mm -hmm. that's only two, right? Uh, yeah. And you've just, you and Alan have just really formed work intelligence as something that could be analyzed. Yeah. And uh, I thought a brilliant way to look at it a new oh, way. Um, but you're still, what, you know, 12 months into it. Uh, yeah. And that's so early stage. So it'll be interesting, uh, you know, look back when we get to the five year mark. Uh, I'll get there before you do. I'm a year ahead. Yeah. But, uh, It'll be interesting to see how that shifted and changed over time. And also, here and here's something else to think about. We don't just do this, you know, so we can have fun, even though we do have fun doing it. <laughs> yes. Uh, you know, Matt and I are kind of like research nerds. Uh, we just love to surface this stuff and tell people about it. Um, but the other reason we do it is because we have clients that are interested in, you know, tell us more. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, go underneath and tell us what is happening. Why do the clients value this information? Well, I've thought long and hard about that, uh, having been a vendor for so many years, Matt, buying this research uh, uh -huh. across the table. Um, usually it's because somebody in the company has asked somebody to validate why are we spending all this money mm -hmm. to, you know, introduce a new product in this market? Or why are we spending so much money to hire salespeople? Yep. Uh, or what, yeah, et cetera, et cetera. It all comes down to there's somebody making a decision at a, uh, either an end user who wants to buy this technology or at a vendor who's making it. Why are we spending this money? And so data like this becomes like gold. It's so valuable for them to either prove the business case or yep. disprove somebody else's business case because in corporate uh, budget uh, analysis and uh, I've been in the middle of it. It's Darwinian, man. People, they come to the meeting and they smile and then they leave the meeting and try to undercut your your data with their own research that they bring yeah. in because they want the budget, right? Yeah, absolutely. And that's the way it is. That, that's absolutely. unfortunately the business world that we live in. So this data becomes very valuable at point, uh, which is why we spend so much time, I think, trying to make sure that if somebody actually unfolded and looked in my computer at the data that I'm sitting with, I could defend it. And I could, uh, and I'm sure you're doing the same thing. Yeah, it's absolutely. Defensive. And and just to bring us back a little bit to where we started when we talked about, you know, the exuberance on revenue, probably the, the, the third largest group of people who look at this data, and I know we both speak to them, are those venture capital firms, those VCs, uh, yeah, who are investing yeah. in those early stage companies, who are basically yeah. saying, I want to be a gambler, but I want to be an educated gambler help me quantify the size of my bet. And I think that's a, that's a big area, of course, that we also yeah. way do that. So anyway, that's our, that's our 30 minutes. Flies past as ever. Next time, does, three more yeah. topics, 30 minutes to discuss them, and it'll be a you know, work intelligence focused one. Dan, thank you ever so much for joining us. Matt, thank you for putting this together and uh, keeping our podcast rolling. And uh, brilliant timing, just in time for lunch. Awesome. All right. Thank you very much for joining us. And... Um, uh, thank you for coming along and, uh, and I'll speak to you next time. Thank you. Cheers.